Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host, and welcome again. Uh, I guess we all had quite a tricky day, and uh, I know I had mine. I hope you had yours, too. Okay, well, it's over with now. we got to go forward. And uh, as you note, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the holy, uh, a major issue here within the Portland metropolitan area, and it's called the CRC, which has been an, an impact on to both states, the state of Oregon and the state of Washington. And there's been discussions on both sides. I've had many discussions uh, here on the Oregon side. But besides that, uh, my, only, my Washington contact was no, normally Tiffany Couch, and we did that for quite some time, and, and everybody got excited about that. You know, show me the money, and where is the money? Well, this, this particular round, what I'm going to do, we, we're fortunate to have with us today someone from Washington that can give us a, a total history of the, the CRC, how it arrived, how it became uh, an issue, um, the funding source. I mean, uh, I mean, even to the point where, where he was part and parcel of writing the check. I don't know what the, where that came from, but uh, <laughs> we'll find out about that part, too. I mean, follow the money. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, my, my friend Scott, uh, Scott Roberts is here. He's part of the Freedom Foundation uh, National Network, uh, National Network Director, Direction, right? Director, right? Citizen Action Network. Citizen, yeah. Citizen Action Network. Okay, good. And is with uh, MyFreedomFoundation.com. That's the website, but you, you can probably follow up on that piece. You'll probably do that as we're talking, whatever. But uh, Scott's going to, we're going to ask Scott a, a number of questions. Uh, things like, what happened on the Vancouver side, the Washington side, but basically the Vancouver, Washington? You know, a lot of times people look at uh, Vancouver, Washington and Portland, Oregon is, is you remember the Vanport days, Vancouver, Portland, remember right? That? Right. So that's just a large, big city. Yeah. Just happened to be two states. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Good. Welcome, Scott. Oh, thank you. Oh, good, thanks, good, Bruce. Good, thanks good. for having me. Yeah. Well, hey, look. Uh, before we get into uh, all this, uh, you know, the things that are that are that have been all in the news, et cetera, et cetera. I thought it'd be just to kind of get a little background of who Scott was and how he how he came about the Pacific Northwest and some of the activities that. Uh, he was involved in that. It was very interesting, so I thought I'd, I'd get him to maybe chair us a little bit. I, uh, I, I've not been as an avid swimmer, but I find that this guy has really been a swimmer, boy. I tell you, look at him. You can see, look at the streak in there. You look, what's, what's that guy that was doing that? Thing? Mark Spitz. Mark Spitz. Yeah. But doesn't he look like Mark? He looked just like him. You look different. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm more handsome than Mark Spitz. Oh, okay. All right. okay good. Well, talk a little bit about yourself. How did you get to the Pacific Northwest? Well, first of all, well, I, I got here with the military family, so oh, I thought really? I'd like to um, tell you that both my both grandfathers, my grandfather okay. on my father's side and my mother's side, were both in the military. Okay. And my father and my stepfather were in the military. And so I was a military brat. What so, branch? Well, they were, they were Army and Air Force. Army and Air Force, okay. Yeah. And so I'd like to thank you for your service. And well, thank you very you much. Know, we, they didn't. None of them made it in the Marines. Well, but. you look like a Marine. Though. Come to think okay. Crew cut. No, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure Dad was had the aspiration to be one, but, but that's okay. Yeah, I'm not going to hold that against you. But, but. So I traveled around as a military kid all okay. over the world. Um, my mother brought me up swimming. So and then I ultimately went to Southern Illinois Southern Illinois University, the Salukis, mm -hmm. and I swam there in college, and came back to the Northwest. Um, but yeah, I had a fantastic career. Got to see all over. In 1986, I was on the U.S. national team in swimming. Uh, oh, yeah. Held a state record in Washington. Those kinds of things. But oh, that's uh, still holding. Uh, not anymore. No, it, it, it was it was broken. So you know that's what happens. That's a fun deal. Yeah, it goes. You go long enough, your records get broken, wow. right? And then after after you got got off the stand, if you will, from swimming, you, you got into something. How'd, how'd you get in this business? I did. So my education and background is in architecture, Obviously. and I went to work for an architectural firm in Tacoma. Uh, worked a number of years, migrated into, uh, had a small construction excavating company. Um, then I got into uh, real estate and uh, real estate development and building. And so if you take that path from mm -hmm. sitting and interfacing with government for right, all right, of those right, years, right, you know, right, 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 at right. some point that draws you into politics. So here, four years ago, I finally just decided to make the switch and go to work for the Freedom Foundation full time. I started as the property rights director, which huh. was a natural yep, for yep, me. Yeah. Um, but now it's it's grown into. Um, I would say I'm I'm probably the guy in in our um, foundation that has the political instinct, the, hmm. the person that tries to figure out strategy where we're going, what we're gonna what we're gonna do. Next. So what, what does the organization do? I mean, what, what's what's that, what's that purpose? 
You know, a lot of people here in Oregon may know um, a group called uh, Cascade Policy Institute. So we're very much like Cascade, but we're in Washington. Uh, we're a 501c3. We're nonpartisan, uh, uh, nonprofit, and we, we work in public policy. So our areas, we work in education, uh, property rights, uh, voter integrity, um, basic issues where we're trying to shape on the conservative side of the ledger, mm -hmm. uh, trying to shape politics in, in Washington. We do, we do the thinking. Hmm. You know, when, when, a lot of times people think about the think tank. You know, the, 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 the urban think tank aspect of people just sitting around, just kind of looking at the issues, right? That's right. And coming up with solutions of some sort, right? That's right. And just interacting with anybody and everybody, right? That's right. And so what we decided here a number of years ago, we're we're a think tank, but our, our board members like to dub us the do tank. Mm -hmm. um, we realized that just writing white papers and just writing policy papers wasn't enough. That didn't mm -hmm. actually get it done. Mm -hmm. And so we've actually taken those ideas and we've pushed them into local government um, all around the state and inter inter interface with citizens, mm -hmm. uh, activist groups, people that want to be successful in different ways, and we help them. Um, it's probably what really differentiates us as a think tank is, is that we actually do the citizen action network piece. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of the grassroots organizing. That's, that's my primary job. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, maybe this, this dovetails right into the Holy Shield CRC, Columbia yeah. River Crossing situation, yeah. right? It goes back for now. And how long have you guys been in existence, by the way? You know, we've been in existence about 22 years now. 22 years. Yeah, about okay. the same time as Cascade Policy Institute. So, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Good, good, good. Well, look, look, let's jump right into the CRC because people are very interested in the, this whole issue. It's the evolution from your perspective. When, when do you think it started? Well, it? the CRC did start in 2005. Right. And it's a unique yeah. deal. Um, it was it was formed as a uh, two states got together. Right. The governors of both states signed an agreement, said we're going to do this project in tandem, and it really created a new agency, so to speak, a new bureaucracy. This mm -hmm. whole life was formed, and they threw money into it and they started funding this project. And it was this idea to figure out how to one replace the the bridge that right. crosses the Columbia there between Vancouver and Hayden Island. Um, but also to solve this congestion problem um, along the, what they call the corridor, so mm -hmm. from Vancouver all the way up to the Rose Quarter. Um, a, as you know, if you've traveled there yeah. much, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's quite congested. So that, the idea was basically to try to solve these problems. The problem was is that they so narrowly defined the, the scope of the project that you could only end up with one solution, which was mm -hmm. a really poorly designed solution and you get light rail as part of that solution. Mm -hmm. So it would be like saying, hey, we're looking for a new host, but he's got to be, you know, 5'9", he's got to be of color, he's got to wear a blue blazer, his mm -hmm. name's got to be Bruce Broussard. You know, it's so narrowly defined that mm -hmm. you then you go out and you do a lot of motion and search, but you only end up with, with one person. That's what they did with the Columbia River Crossing project. Mm -hmm. They so narrowly defined the the scope of the project that you could only end with one solution at the end of the day hmm. and they ended up with the worst solution hmm. um, and I think that at the end of the day that's really the, the 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 biggest rub about this project it's been so expensive yet and it's been a terrible solution it's it's been uh, and I think you've had it on your show before some oh, alternative yeah. solutions sure. as to what sure. you know what what were out there but there's been a lot of other ways to approach this project that were mm -hmm. never done um, so that's that's been one of the tragedies of the project. But, but, like, but like I said, a lot of folks are out there looking now, for instance, for trying to figure out so many years and so many people were involved. You know, it was just basically sitting around talking, but no action. Yeah, I mean, there was, there well, there, there was action. There was almost $180 million spent. Uh, not so 200 that's, or something. No. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, uh, 20 the, or something. No. Yeah, the number keeps growing. And but still the, spending. Yeah, what's interesting is you may be familiar with the, the Hoover dam right, right? right they had to do a bypass bridge because they didn't want big trucks going over the dam mm -hmm. for the new nine you know 9-11 and terrorist stuff that total project was 240 million dollars just the bridge the bridge portion was 114 million dollars so we've spent more pushing paper for the columbia river crossing bridge than it did for the entire construction cost of the hoover dam bypass project and a lot of that is due to the environmental push. So both in Washington and Oregon, we're environmentalists. We, we like to think that we're doing the best things that we can for the environment, but it makes a very Byzantine permitting process, right? It makes you spend a lot of money, time and effort mm -hmm. going through, you know, 
satisfying these studies for the for the environmentalists. And to date, we spent over one hundred eighty million dollars doing just that. All we've done on that project is push paper, do some engineering, mm -hmm. and get a permit. You know, for $180 million. you know, as you think about this, also too, is that um, this project has gone through several administrations. Yes, it has several administrations. As if no one says anything about this. Yeah, when the signs a check, right? Supposedly, right. But highway departments are a pretty powerful group. Right? Very, very powerful. The boards, group. right? Yep. Got me. But the governors are basically ultimately they're supposed to be the one that was responsible for this. So, like every time a governor administration would get on board, they would come up with a whole new quote, a whole new design, and the whole nine yard, right? That's right. Okay. Well, or they would change the they would try to change the direction, but it mostly, you know, I, I think that direction continued to move down the light rail path around the Columbia, Columbia River pro, uh, Crossing project. You're talking about the change administrations. There was a recent change. We got Governor Inslee, so right. it replaced uh, Governor Gregoire. But the Secretary of Transportation, the Washington uh, State Department of Transportation Secretary, is appointed by the governor. And so he changed. We got one of your people. Oh, you got, come on, really? <laughs> yeah. So a gal named uh, Lynn Peterson was the new appointee for the Washington State Department of Transportation. Now get this, okay? She was the former transportation advisor to Kitzhaber. Before that, she was a Clackamas County chairwoman. Before that, she was Lake Oswego uh, councilwoman, I believe, maybe maybe mayor there, but councilwoman anyway. Um, prior to that, she was Thousand Friends of Washington, or Thousand Friends of Oregon. We, we have the Thousand Friends of Washington. Gee. Thousand Friends of Oregon. She came right out of the environmental movement. She was transportation advisor uh, to both, uh, to, to TriMet. Um, Wow. So she's been in that in that movement, right in very place. strong environmentalist movement. Governor Inslee is an environmentalist. He brought her in as a secretary of transportation. So she's right along with light rail, and and, and light rail is problematic on this project for for a number of reasons. Uh, the 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 largest of is cost. Okay. Um, it really drives the cost up of this project. And we don't need light rail at this point. We could do rapid bus transit. You could, a mm -hmm. lot of solutions, a, a lot of other rate. solutions, yeah. yeah. But anyway, it was, I thought it was interesting that Lynn Peterson is now, came from Oregon, is now the, the Well, it should have happened then, shouldn't it? Well, it, like both sides would, would, have, would have, looked like we should have had a bridge, wouldn't you think? You know, it should have happened except for uh, a couple of legislators out of the 17th and 18th districts, Senator Don Benton, Okay. Uh, Senator Ann Rivers, uh, Liz Pike, and um, and Paul Harris. That group of legislators really educated the people in the legislature of Washington. You know, this project was stopped in Washington. So this is a you know this is a two state project, right? We're both going to put money in equally. Right. Plus, we're going to bring some federal highway uh, uh, transportation funds in to this project as well. Well, it so happens that in the regular sessions of last year, Oregon passed the funding for the CRC project, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No problem. Hey, we want to do it. In fact, um, the Oregon Republican Party came out and recommended a no vote. Yep, I mean, yep. But a whole bunch of your legislators and uh, Republican legislators in, in Oregon didn't listen to them. In fact, there was a dozen or so of them that, that went ahead and voted for it. And when I think about the people that push back, our legislators in Washington, and our citizens did a great job of educating the legislature in Washington how bad this project was. It's not that we don't want to fund construction projects. It's not that Washington doesn't want to um, keep our freeways congested. We want to solve congestion problems mm -hmm. as well. We just want to do it at the lowest cost with the best solution. This was the highest cost with the worst solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was the worst possible project. Well, Oregon didn't get the message. So I don't know what was happening in Oregon to make people think that this was a good idea. There certainly wasn't a citizen group that was pushing back. And if there was, they were invisible. I call it the stealth technology or silent. There was a great one in Washington and they stopped it. So imagine this pressure, 2013 regular session, yeah. Oregon passes it. We're ready to go. Yeah. We want to do the project. Okay. They brought in the U.S. Secretary of Transportation. Right. This guy's name, uh, Ray LaHood, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ray LaHood. Mm -hmm. They brought him to Washington to talk to our legislator. All of our legislators. Ray LaHood said, said, stood in front of him and said, look, Oregon's brought their money in. Our, the federal money's not going to last forever. The time is now. If you're going to pass it, you have to pass it now. Otherwise, the money's going to evaporate. What are you going to do? 
those legislators that I mentioned in the 17th, 18th, uh, uh, Senator uh, River, Senator Benton, uh, Liz Pike, and um, and Paul Harris, they said, look, that's a that's a red herring. That hmm. money's always going to be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is just a ruse right now. We're gonna we're gonna wait. We're not going to pass this project, and we're just going to wait and see what happens. And they didn't fund it. That project really officially died in our regular in our regular session because Washington didn't come up with the funding. Now they found some ways to wiggle around that since the spring of this of 2013, and that project has kind of stayed on life support all the way up through all the way up through now. Right. Um, so our the Washington side basically says, "Hey, look, um, we, we can keep the project going. The legislature, the, our legislature hasn't funded money for it. So as long as our our state doesn't put any more money into it, we can still participate in it, right? If the funding comes from other places, so that funding has been coming from Oregon, and, I, and maybe some funding from the feds, but the the money has been yeah, leaking, right, exactly, continued to leak exactly, into that project." Right, right. Um, past September. I think September was the, the final mm-hmm. date that the project had to be shut down. And they've, they've kept it on life support. Um, and still it, is. It's still on life support. Oregon has this conversation going on now about a go-it-alone plan. Yeah, so yeah. we, we want to fund this project on our own. They have good reason. And the reason is TriMet. And TriMet, it's all around light rail. TriMet is functionally bankrupt. Hmm. It just simply means they're spending more money than they're taking in in ridership. Mm -hmm. They can't continue to operate that way for a long time. So what they do is they build very expensive construction projects to give them the next link or the next little Uh bit of rail. It's a Ponzi scheme. As long as we're building out in front these very expensive projects, we can backfill that money into funding our our operations. Call it basically a Ponzi scheme. Their next Ponzi scheme was the rail from uh, to go across the Columbia River Crossing project, hmm. hugely expensive. That was going to keep TriMet afloat for a few more years or a decade until they have to build the next, hmm. you know, little bit of their rail system. So in a, in a lot of ways, it's a good, um, I, I, you know, you hate to see an organization go bankrupt, you know, like TriMet that's providing a service, but if they're not. If they're not solvent, right, 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 the people need to know. And maybe sometimes the only way is to make them go bankrupt and say, "Look, this this just isn't working. We don't need to keep building more uh, more rail lines. We need to basically stop, you know, stop the bleeding." And, but that's a decision for Oregon. What? But Oregon, Oregon's, um, they they really need to do something mm-hmm. with the light rail and the Columbia River Crossing project was going to be the the savior of it. I think the Washington side said, look, we don't want light rail. You can build the bridge light rail ready if you want. Um, but we want to make sure we get the most bang for our buck. And this, and this project is not, it, by a long stretch of the imagination, is not, is not it. So, Well, you know, part of, part of the, uh, the so-called communication from, that Oregonians were getting from Washington in regards to the, hey, we're going to do it on our own, so to speak. We'd have to fund the whole thing, right? And Washington was going to sit back and say, okay, just come on. I mean, what was the discussion on the other side of the bridge? Well, I think the discussion going on around the Oregon Go It Alone plan is yeah. it's, it's, it's a way to ultimately suck Washington back into the project, right? right? Because, right, right. you know, look, it's a $3 billion project. And you're talking a Go It Alone plan at, you know, 400 or $500 million. You're not even, you're not even halfway there with the funding. So, you know, our sense is that what will happen is they'll spend $500 million on a project moving forward. They'll go put some pilings in. They'll start tearing down the existing bridge. You know, they'll do whatever. They'll basically start, say, oh, we ran out of money. Now you have to do something, right? Now you have to get together and you have to come. So the worst scenario, the worst possible thing that can happen is to start construction with a totally unfunded project go it alone plan it just means hey we're just going to start mm-hmm. it, it, it is not a plan to finish mm-hmm. you know another another major concern with the public from that standpoint you know the, the governor was talking as if uh, you know it's like other people's money i mean sometimes people don't tend to recognize the fact that it is a government of the people by the people and for the people and we said no 
We said no too on this side of the hill, but yet and still, you know, you know, we're still going to go along with the project. And so, who's who's running the train? Yeah, I mean, on both sides of the aisle, for that matter. You know, I mean, even either day, what's the, the the governor now? I mean, he's basically making the same point. If if someone says no, it's no. Right. What's 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 so hard about no? Right. Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, it's what a, kind of discussion were you guys having on the other side? Well, I. I <sighs> They got Midori and all those guys. I've talked with them. They've, they've been on the show, et cetera, and then they basically were part and parcel, right, of stopping the project also, too. Yeah, I think Midori played a played a major role in mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, when you looked at, at what he did, I think he, he did, uh, has done a Herculean effort to stop the bridge. Yeah. He created a group down there called the no -tolls, uh, dot com. No, yeah. uh, and they basically said, hey, look, we'd like to have a bridge, right? I think it's a good idea. But the tolling is going to really hurt our economy, and so we don't want to fund this bridge with tolling because we find it's a barrier for the for the most vulnerable in the mm -hmm. community, right? Hey, an eight dollar an eight dollar toll for someone making a, a million bucks a year, right. it's not a big deal. An eight dollar toll each way for somebody making nine dollars an hour is a couple hours worth mm -hmm. of work mm -hmm. every day just to get to work. Mm -hmm. it has a huge impact on those families. Mm -hmm. And so what Maduro was saying is, look, let's do a bridge, but let's figure out how to do it without the tolls. And that's where a lot of these alternative ideas, um, you know, kind of were born out. Um, Vancouver, the city of Vancouver and Clark County has done advisory votes. They voted no right. for the tolls. Um, and a lot of times they voted no for the bridge project itself, but especially for the tolls. Um, and so... Like I said, I think there's that group in Vancouver and those legislators in Vancouver that have really done a great job of educating the Washington legislature mm -hmm. and telling them that they don't want to do this project. Hey, if the constituents in our little town, in our districts right here that are being impacted by this bridge are saying don't do this bridge, the rest of the state should listen to them. The CRC project all the way up now, so we've had some special sessions mm -hmm. right, uh, during the year, it's been off the table. CRC has not been um, part of the discussion, and it doesn't look like it's going to even be part of. We're, we're talking about a transportation package coming up. We've got a lot of big transportation projects going on in Washington. Um, it doesn't even look like it's going to be a part of the conversation of the transportation package coming up in this next session. And we have to we have to wait and see because anything can happen. But there, it's it's not a front burner. Hmm. It's not on the front burner conversation in Washington the way it is in Oregon right now. Hmm. In in Oregon, it's very much, hey, let's figure out how to do this. Let's let's you know g the go alone plan. You well, know? You, well you, I noticed that you guys just recently had an election, right? City council, or whatever. I guess that was wasn't there something about a vote there. And no, yeah, on what the way <laughs> was going to go, and then and then you got the you got the Colombian. I mean, who's been supporting this piece? I mean, uh, yeah, we had a huge election. Um, we had an election in the 26th legislative district. One of our representatives, uh, there, there was a move. So Derek Helmer, who was a Democrat in the 26th legislative district, was elected to Congress. Okay. He had an appointee, but that seat had to have a, a, an election this year. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, you had a semi-incumbent, um, you know, appointed Democrat, and then you had Jan Angel who ran against him. Jan Angel, the Republican, beat him. So we picked up one more seat, the Republicans picked up one more seat in, um, in the Senate. Our Senate is a crazy, what they call a, a really a power sharing agreement. It's a bipartisan agreement. Mm -hmm. Two Democrats last year crossed over, joined the Republicans, hmm. and created a new coalition of majority hmm. in the Senate. Um, but it was mostly around, they split the committees, half of those committees like the environmental committees and social committees went to chairs of the Democrats, more of the fiscal committees went to chairs of Republicans. With Jan Angel winning in the 26, it gives one more seat towards the Republicans. So on really contentious votes where you might be able to peel one Republican off, mm -hmm. for instance, of a, of a senator, um, environmental, big construction projects, right? Um, the Republicans are holding one more vote in the Senate now, so it's even less likely today than it was last year or this upcoming session than it was last session that that the crc can move forward because of the senate and jan angel is uh, very fiscally responsible she's a great friend of property rights she's very staunch conservative so it's going to be a no vote 
on the mm -hmm. Columbia River Crossing project as it stands, uh, uh, I would think, from her. So, yeah. No, interesting election. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. You, you know, what, what, what do you, at this point in time, what's your feel about is it going to go? And, when, if, and if so, when do when you think it might go? When, or do you think it's, gonna, it's, it's, it's under the bus now? Well, I mean, you know, the thing about the thing about Governor Kitzhaber is when he wants something, he has, you know, he's a political animal and he has a way of figuring out how to get it. Jay Inslee is not half the leader of Kitzhaber from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. Jay Inslee is becoming a laughing stock, not not only on the Republican side, but also the Democrats. They're looking at him saying, this guy, every time he opens his mouth, it's a new political gaffe. Mm. Uh, he he's 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 failing at the things that he's trying to promote. They're not going through. Um, he's really, I think, looked at as on the Columbia River Crossing project as a tool of Kitzhaber. Right? He's mm. now has Kitzhaber's right hand woman, who was the transportation advisor, as his secretary of transportation. I, I think people are seeing it as an extension. But the thing that I think Kitzhaber is probably, you know, getting aware of is that Inslee doesn't have the, the credibility with the Washington State Legislature. And so I don't think that... Um, or even Washington, President Obama. I, I mean, don't... There's a, there's a, or in there, D.C., yeah, yeah, no. DC. Yeah, I mean, D.C. A, uh, DC yeah, was I mean, probably, uh, you know, uh, had a little sigh of relief yeah. getting rid of Inslee. So I don't think Washington is going to jump on the CRC bandwagon th this coming session. You don't think so? I don't think so. Um, uh, that, that's not to say that it doesn't come up. That doesn't mean to say that there's not another fight around it. Um, but I don't think it happens on the Washington side. So if if something does happen, it'll be in Oregon. It'll be a go to loan plan, and they'll start construction, and they'll get Washington pulled into it. Um, you know, four or five years down the road, as as they've run out of money, as the project's halfway, as there's no way to get. You know, maybe they've yeah. Yeah. <laughs> blown up the existing yeah. bridge, and there's no way to get across. Whatever. Um, they'll pull Washington back in. The, what, what Oregon needs to do right now is do a good job of educating their legislature, just like we did in, in Washington, about how bad this project is. We're not, we're not mm. against construction projects. We're not against solving you know, uh, these congestion problems. We're not about uh, limiting commerce and transportation. But this is just the wrong idea. It's too expensive. It's the worst solution. You shouldn't spend any money on it. And anybody in the Oregon legislature that does, they're 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 voting for something else, right? They're saying yeah. I'm voting for this, but they're making a deal. Yeah. They're voting to keep TriMet out of uh, out of bankruptcy. They're they're doing it for some other reason. So, yeah, Columbia River Crossing project all, from from start to finish is um, too expensive, and it's a bad solution. You know, as you know, as we talk about this whole piece, you know, who's representing the people? I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why we have you here today, <laughs> because you're out there in the grassroots aspect, of, uh, as opposed to Cascade. They're not into that kind of uh, mix. They don't have a mix here for that long, right? For yeah, Cascade does. Um, they they do excellent policy work. John Charles has done some of the most fantastic yeah, yeah. work around light rail and transportation policy the, of anybody that I yes, know. Yes, he has. He's been on the show several times. And Cascade will tell you, they would love to build a grassroots organizing arm hmm. of the Cascade Policy Institute. Um, they, they, they would just need the funding to do that, right? Um, I mean, I've, I've talked to them about even helping them uh, come along and help them to, to build it. Um, and I think it's something they should do. If it's Cascade, it's another group. Somebody down here really needs to organize the grassroots mm -hmm. in a way that's effective, right? This is not the conservative people that um, uh, the the typical rhetoric. This is getting one-on-one right. -on -one with people, talking to them about good solutions, bad solutions, why this is, and in in this case, the Columbia River Crossing project, why it's so bad. We're not against building right. a bridge, just against building this yeah. bridge. This but, one's not a good one. But I noticed you rallied the troops. <laughs> you, you rattled the troops enough to say no, right? You understand what I'm saying? We did. We uh, and I, I, I was a, my uh, personally and and my organization around the CRC project. We were a fairly small part of it. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of people that did a lot more effort than, than we did on that particular one. But but we we did. I mean, I think as a, as a whole as a movement, um, those those groups down in Vancouver did a yeah. fantastic yeah. job. Yeah. 
Medora included, yeah. of educating the Washington State Legislature about about why they didn't want this project. You know, when, and when when Medora basically picked up Tiffany Couch, this forensic uh, auditor aspect yep. of it, I thought that was quite a move. Yep. I mean, it was like meat and potatoes. What you know, show me the money, and they showed the money. There's people's pockets, whatever. Yeah, I mean, you you look back on something like that, and you know, um, yeah, it's it's some genius to that. Yeah, oh, you yeah. know. Oh, yeah. And, um, but the thing that stuck out to me about Tiffany's Couch's um, study was, at the time, you know, $170 million spent, right, now $180 right, right, million right, right. spent. There was $20 million for that project that Washington State Department couldn't of Transportation account. couldn't account for. It was just a journal entry. Now, we know what it was. It was labor. But they, they won't show the records of how it was paid out. Is, yeah, he, that's... He. That's a problem, right? I mean, yeah. that's just a transparency issue that needs to be solved. Well, I tell you what we'll do. We're going to take a short break. Let's we'll, do it. You're going to tell me where the $20 million is, right? Okay. <laughs> We're going to find out. Okay, fine. We're going to take a short break, folks. We'll be right back. <laughs> Scott. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back, folks. Hey, guess what? We're back again. And uh, we've been talking here with Scott Roberts from, on the Washington side, you know what I mean? The comparable Cascade Institute kind of a entity over there. But it's just enjoyable, just a, just a mere fact that we're getting information, if you will, about the CRC from someone who's a group who's very, very active in, the whole, uh, you know, in this whole issue. And because we're still concerned. You're welcome, Scott. We're still concerned about... Uh, where do we go from here? You know, I mean, you know, we've got Tiffany to give us the numbers, if you will. We're still spending the money. Uh, Oregon, many Oregonians are saying we don't want this bridge. It's too expensive. I mean, we've had um, uh, we have engineers come on. I've, ha I've even had uh, folks, uh, in fact, uh, one of the senior uh, engineers from TriMet hmm. since retired was on, in fact, a couple weeks ago. And, uh, and made a pitch in regards to um, the type of bridge that should be built. And and the cost factor in the whole nine yards, but no one's listening to them. So I guess the question that we had the Tiffany Council stand, like I said, we got we got we got all these folks now talking on this side of the river, and uh, we don't know where to go. So uh, what about your side of the river? Uh, are you hearing anything from the standpoint of uh, uh, like things like okay, we're spending, we're still spending money? Uh, are they are they are they spending any money on the other side? Because like it's together, so to speak. And um, 
So what do we see as, as a citizen, the, the average citizen? What do they do? I mean, it's their money. It's their money, you know. And I, I, the thing that I hear the most often is how do you kill this project? Yeah. Right? It was supposed to be done. The legislature said we weren't going to fund it. Right. Yet it it has a way of continuing you know, continuing on. It's got this life. Sounds like a Ponzi screen. No, 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 no. <laughs> Somebody needs to go to jail. It's it sounds like a project that the legislature, you know, some some powerful politicians in some places keep allocating money for it. But it's our money. It's the public's money. It's our money. We need to figure out a way to to I think maybe just officially stop the 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 clump, the, the project. Just mm. say this one's done. Now, if we want to start a new project and investigate, you know, an alternative bridge design or a different way of doing, you know, we can start that down in the future. But, yeah, I, I don't I, – I, that's the thing that I think of most often I hear mm-hmm. is how do we actually get this – now that this project started, how do we, how do we how stop do we, it? How do we stop it? Yeah, and there's – there's political will, I think, starting to build on the Washington side. On the Oregon side, I don't think there is. No, no, there isn't. I mean, I, I guess, you know, the other thing that, um, and people are really just down on the whole issue of Congress you know, from, a, from a national standpoint, and even locally, for that right. matter. You know what I'm saying? And they're not listening. Yeah, they're not listening. Um, one of the groups that's not listening is C-TRAN. C-TRAN. Yeah, so C-TRAN is the, um, the Clark County Transit Authority. Right. And they... Um, entered into a contract that binds them to TriMet. And they did it under, they did it here a month or so ago. And it was a very contentious meeting. It was a 5-4 vote. So five of the CTRAN board members voted to enter into this agreement. They hadn't even seen the agreement yet. Wow. Yeah, they hadn't seen the final agreement. The next day, the agreement was produced and signed and authorized and it authorized this binding agreement to TriMet. Now, the details of it are still coming out, but there was a lot of talk that they were giving their eminent domain power over to basically TriMet. So any 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 land that TriMet needed taken, CTRAN would take it and then hand it over to their to their agency. Those details are still unraveling exactly what that agreement is, but it was done under the cover of darkness, and it was another one of these political moves to try to move forward the uh, the Columbia River Crossing project. Mm-hmm. Number of things. Uh, the, the the other deal that happened too was the um, the Coast Guard. So the Coast Guard right, came right, out right, originally right. and said the bridge was too low, right, right? right? Right at the last minute, they said, "Oh no, it's it's high enough now." You know, we'll, we'll, we'll permit it. We'll work around. Well, that has national implication on that piece. That is huge. Administration, that's huge. Yeah, huge implications. And there's, yeah. um, you know, the flow of commerce. And you don't really know yeah. what would be built upstream that they might need to get down the river. And if you're not accommodating, you know, two or three businesses already that can't utilize the, the, the bridge, you know, what, what ones in the future will be, mm-hmm. will be mm-hmm. limited. So, yeah, big problems with it. Mm-hmm. Tell you what, we're going to take a couple of calls. Maybe there's someone out there in the audience that might uh, might give us a little input, right? Yeah. And by the way, if you, if you uh, either side, if you got some info on Washington side or Oregon side, please give us a call. We'll put the number on the screen. Uh, see if the guys can put the number on the screen and do give us a call, and they'll set that up. But we'll just continue uh, talking a little bit about uh, about these other issues. I, I I was also thinking in terms of of uh, when you look at the bridge, even even if you, you get a, if they build the bridge, you still have bottlenecks on either end. I mean, once you get off the bridge, you you bottleneck. I mean, what, what what's that all about? You know, you could tell me better, but it seems like <laughs> it, it seems like when I'm coming out of Washington and yeah, traveling right. south and I find right, right. Now I know if that drawbridge goes up, you're going to get stuck there. Exactly. Right? But I come across I I come booking across the bridge. Right. And where I slow down is at the Rose Quarter. That's where the bottleneck is. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, obviously, when that when that drawbridge goes up, you're going to get slowed down there at the at the bridge. But um, it doesn't seem to me that the that the real transportation bottleneck is at the yeah. bridge. It okay. seems like it's further further exactly. south. Yeah. But it's um, still a bottleneck. It's huge. Oh, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Big big problem. So 
Yeah, there's all kinds, like, like I said, there's, and I think that's when you, when you define the project as only looking very narrowly at this particular bridge, at this particular, you know, set of criteria for design, you, you, you come down to this one solution. Mm -hmm. If you utilize good design build, world renowned bridge designers, right. a guy like I know on the San Juan Islands, a guy named Kevin Peterson, at his own expense, for free. This is a this is not you know some hack bridge right, designer right. world renowned bridge designer someone mm -hmm. who's to build designed bridges all over the world mm. at his own expense designed a reasonable alternative to the Columbia River crossing bridge okay. which is a safer bridge costs less yeah mm. and so um, when you when you have people like that, I think we need to utilize them in the design build right. process. Over a second, look like we got a caller. Okay, calling on the air. Your question or comment, please. Yes. Good, good afternoon. I was wondering. Um, I am a, a a resident of Clark County, and I've read in the Columbian about all these different uh, potential options. You know, a third bridge here, there, and everywhere. Right. Uh, so many simplistic added uh, alternatives exist, like. Why not, as my husband suggested, who also is an architect, why not use the bypass of 205 for um, the business part? So the bypass is the very, you know, the very heart of Portland where we do get that congestion mm -hmm. out of the Rose Quarter. Good point. And then use the 5 as, as we normally would for, you know, lighter traffic. And that was his thought. Why not use that as the truck, you know, the truck alternative over on the 205? And I'll, I'll pose that question to, to both of you. Yes, thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Yes. Yeah, I think, you know, well, I think that's the problem. Would, would that work or would that not work in particular? I, I don't know. But, but the problem has been early in the design process, these alternatives were not completely vetted and looked at. So, yeah, maybe sending the truck traffic over on 205 is a good way of, of you know, bypassing and relieving um, the congestion. Um, I love the idea. I, I think about the Tacoma Narrows Bridge where they left the existing bridge and they built another bridge right next to it, so they doubled the capacity. I mean, what about that, right? Yeah, that, that was one of the options that was just recently put on board, too, by the way. Yeah, that was Keep one of yours. Maintaining, maintaining the present I-5 bridge, okay, and then putting a third bridge. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Peterson's design alternative was to create what they call a collector distributor. So. One of the expenses, or the, the one of the largest expenses of the bridge for the Columbia River crossing as it was designed, it's really high, so that creates these big ramps, and the ramps are very land hungry, so they so you have to go buy a bunch of land, so that that drive that's a cost driver. Mm -hmm. What he did was he figured out how to make a collector distributor from across the Hayden Island stuff, mm -hmm. so that's local traffic, slower traffic, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then um, and then putting the faster traffic up above, mm -hmm. um, just a lot of. Uh, yeah, I think we need to figure out how to vet all of these different kinds of ideas in a process that brings us to the best solution, whether it's a bypass on 205, whether it's a tandem bridge, whether it's a collector distributor design model, whatever that looks like, or a third bridge um, possibility. We need to thoroughly vet the input and have a government that's willing to listen to those ideas. In this case, the government was not willing to listen to anything else other than what they got. Mm -hmm. They had a predetermined plan, and that's exactly what the bridge is. Well, you know, and as, as she was saying, you know, I mean, that's common sense. What she was just talking about, just plain common sense. But it's costing us something like, like a 200 million bucks plus as we're still speaking about this whole piece. You know, right, so, right. so where's going to be the enthusiasm, the same group that we're going to probably use <laughs> to be able to talk about this whole vetting process that you're talking about? So anyway, I tell her, uh, thanks for calling and making me feel welcome, you know. <laughs> Uh, for, from the Washington side, but also contact, you know, uh, Senator Ann Rivers and um, and uh, Liz Pike, Representative Liz Pike and Rep Representative Paul Harris. Those are great people that are really representing you well down there that want to listen to these other kinds of these other kinds of options. Mm -hmm. But I guess until we get the nod from the governor over there, what are we going to do? I, you know, the, the 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 Senate in Washington is controlling the decisions right now. They're controlling the decision right now. The power base is is in the Senate. So said, all eyes said on the no. Senate. They've said no, right? And they got another vote this this election cycle out of the 26th with Jan Angel. And I think they're probably going to continue to say no. They're going to continue to say no. I think so. So where, where's, our, where's our senators? 
<laughs> well, I can tell you the maybe ones get, that voted yes for it before. Yeah, maybe you can yeah, talk to them. Yeah, and, well, uh, well, well, I guess the, on, on the Senate side, Courtney was kind of like, um, first off, he, he supported it initially, I guess, somewhat. And he's yeah. sort of like straddle the fence there for quite some time. Well, your senators, Hansel, yeah. Cano, yeah. Guys, Starr, yeah. and Winters, yeah. those yeah. all voted for it originally. Yeah, yeah. initially, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. And uh, so, you know, but uh, I think he's changing his mind a bit now. So I think the, the latest was it, well, maybe, maybe not, that type of thing. Well, I'll tell you what, when, when the, 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 the leveraging point that Oregonians have right now is the cost of the project hasn't changed. Yeah. But one of the funders is out of the picture. So the, the cost to Oregon has doubled. Yeah, but whose cost? I, I said, who's, call, who's calling the shot? It's not the, the people. Yeah. The people are not calling the shot. It's their representation. They should, they should get mad. I mean, They should get mad. But the, but the cost to Oregonians has doubled Okay, on this project. It's a $3 billion project. So, so where are they going to get the money? I mean, i got, I got to ask you. Maybe, you might, maybe you'll, we'll, we'll, cons we'll have you as a consultant <laughs> and do some grassroots stuff down at the legislature. Let's do it. Let's we, do it. We can do that some other <laughs> stuff. I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, how do they go about, how do they go about doing this? Any well, they'll, they'll, they, they, they will at some point in time need to convince people why they need to raise their taxes so that they can pay for this, to pay for this bridge. Well, I heard that. I, in fact, I saw that in the... Uh, our state paper, the Oregonian today, about I guess it uh, Hess or something, that made mention about the fact the possibility of a sales tax. Yeah, you know, it's, they, they have to look at taxes, or they have to look at um, potentially uh, tolling the bridge. Tolling maybe makes sense for Oregon. Um, it it keeps it keeps workers out of Oregon, right? Yeah. Because it makes it more expensive. Everybody's going to go on two hundred five, and then what, what's the order in the building? Well, they have to, they'll have to toll two hundred five most likely, because that's um, studies show that the minute you toll one bridge, but you have a bridge that's a reasonable alternative, and you know just a free market um, idea, right? Well, now you know, folks. You hear it? They're going to toll two hundred five too. <laughs> you heard <Right>. it here. <laughs> I think they have to toll 205. If, if, if you end up tolling the I-5 bridge, I think you have to toll 205. It's just... To prevent them from going over there for freebies. Yeah. I mean, I do that even now. For, forget about the cost. I would do it for sure if there was a cost difference. But, you know, you look at the traffic reports right now, right? And you say, well, which is, which is quicker? And sometimes it's quicker to go 205. So as I'm coming down south on I-5, sometimes I just go 205 and come in. Yeah, but on the other hand, is it's like the lady was talking about, about the detour of the trucks and whatever. You see that in all large cities and whatever. Uh, here, if they came up with a, a third bridge, according to one of the, uh, one of the proposers that, uh, that they proposed in, at this one particular session that I went to, uh, it would be half that cost, mm -hmm. you know, if, if not maybe a third, if you will. Therefore, would need a toll. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, uh, the, the cost drivers, I think, for us, at least initially, like, you know, we spent $180 million, right? Yeah. We spent that on permitting, paper pushing and permitting. That's right. This yeah. is environmental cost, okay? You may have seen in the news in Washington, the Skagit River Bridge collapsed. Yes. It was hit by a truck. Uh, they hit one of the girders. This, so how we used to build bridges were these green steel girder right. bridges, right? right? Like right. the Columbia River Crossing Bridge. Now we build these simple span concrete bridges. That's That's all we do. Um, but anyway, they built that, that collapse. They have re already replaced that bridge. Just like that. Washington's yeah. already replaced yeah. it. They said, hey, no permitting needed, right? Fast track it, move it forward. Boom, you've got that cost. A couple things. We could, we could streamline our per permitting process, just like we did for the Sk Skagit River Bridge. We could do that for all of our construction projects right. in Washington. It'd be great. We pay a sales tax on all state construction projects. So there's a 10% of, of the public construction projects right. that, that are just going to pay taxes. Just pay taxes. Yeah. We can eliminate the taxes for, for public funded construction projects. Um, we, could, uh, we could work on prevailing wage uh, laws and we could reduce the cost there. Um, s let me see. I think it was the city of Vancouver stood to gain about $71 million from the Columbia River Crossing project. Just in the taxes they would Just get for the sales tax, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. You know, when you talked about it, something came up to mind was in regards to the person that ran in that bridge and all of a sudden it, it, it went down or whatever, and then all of a sudden you said the taxpayers had to foot the bill, right? Mm -hmm. What happened to insurance? 
I mean, you know, you, you got a car, you're driving a car. I mean, you, you, comprehension insurance, you, you, wouldn't you think it would be logical just to pick up some insurance on something like that? Yeah, those things. Yeah. You wouldn't have to worry picking <laughs> up the cost. I mean, the, someone would have written it. They would have written the policy, right? Yeah, that's right. You know, the history of bridges. Well, in fact, these, these bridges are, in, um, they, there is insurance that's carried on them. And so you remember the uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge, right? Yeah. So Galloping Gertie, right? Yeah. This is the yeah. history of bridges in Washington. We, we can't, we don't know how to build bridges, right? Jeez. Galloping Gertie, that yeah, one right, class. Exactly, right. I, I 90, the 520 bridge, right? All these bridges are, have had. And they were carrying problems. insurance? And they were carrying? Yeah. So the, the person who was supposed to have insured that bridge didn't in the original, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And it collapsed and they came back to collect the insurance. That guy left to, you know, go off to Mexico. So, of course, the taxpayers were were holding the bag government, on that. Right, government, right? The government. The taxpayers had to had to pay for that. But in this particular case, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't have the insurance on this bridge. Well, uh, you know, you're, you get into a liability insurance issue. So right. was it the, the trucker, right? Um, was it the government that was responsible for it? Um, the, the, the word on that bridge is that the, our Department of Transportation, of all its wisdom, didn't know how to use a tent measure and had the had the height mismarked on that bridge and so the 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 equipment came through and was just a little bit too high and hit the girder in it and it and it broke it so and he got a raise right he probably did yeah so <laughs> he's he's probably like the chief engineer now right now you know, it, you know, it really bothers you and just just common sense stuff just like we're talking about right now. and we got people out there representing this representing getting paid either as employees I working for the Department of Transportation or if not, that the legislator who basically signed off on the bill or the governor or whatever. Nothing happens to those folks. And it comes back to the public. It comes back to the taxpayer to pick up the, pick up the money. Yeah, it's a huge problem in government is, um, you know, the mistakes of government are borne by the taxpayers, right? Um, it's, it's why we can't forget where the, where, where the power comes right, from in right, government. Right, right. But I, I would say, too, in all of my dealings um, with both, I think, politicians and the bureaucracy, there's a lot of good people in government oh, that want to yeah. do the right things. There's a few people with political agendas, you know, or want to, in, in, you know, increase their influence that are making that make and drive bad decisions. It's those people that we need to, you know, shine yeah, shine but, a spotlight but, on and but run Scott, them out. Scott, I'm gonna I'm not gonna let them off that easy. The bottom line <laughs> is that they're sitting right there at the same table, mm -hmm. and they see the wrongdoing. Why can't they speak up? Or did they join the club? Well, it's, it's an interesting thing about the Freedom Foundation is we have, we're covered under the media shield law very much like, you know, uh, uh, just like the media is. And we, we work with whistleblowers in our state government. And so right on our website, you can go and we encourage whistleblowers to tell us their story so that, that we can go in and help and investigate and get the word out about what's happening in government. People are worried about their jobs. They're worried about retribution, political retribution. If you're a bureaucrat and you're sitting there and, and you're three or four down on the tier and you see something going wrong, but you know if you blow the whistle that your boss is going to show you the door, that's scary for a lot of people. And so um, the Freedom Foundation has a whistleblower program. People can go to our website. If they're in government, they see bad things happening, they can contact us. We'll keep them confidential and we'll help, and we'll help to investigate and help to root that out. Hmm. Um, uh, there's, I'd imagine there's groups in in Oregon that that can no, work with we, we don't we don't have them here. We're well, still, let's get we're it started. We're still spending the money. All right, we'll get let's <laughs> get it started. Still, we're still spending the money. <laughs> we need to help any any whistleblowers that are out there in government. We need to help them because because they're they're it's not every day, but there are bad things that happen, and we need to know about it when it does. Well, we get into we're getting into term limit, you know, on, on the other side of the, the coin, if you will, because folks are kind of like they. Uh, my impression a lot of times now in Congress, you know, when the, a person gets elected. To we say Congress or whatever. Uh, when they get down the first day, they they get met by they're met by the entourage, if you will. By the way, here's a here's your here's your packet. All you, do, <laughs> all you have to do is just be here a couple of terms, and you'll pick up your million. Yeah, let, let me and then let, say nothing. Yeah, here's your script. You know, exactly. Let me tell you, say exactly. It. Um, no, no facetious, but you know, but understand that's the feeling now of a lot of the public folk. We we need leadership big time. Yeah, and you need to, the, the public needs to keep pressure on these people, right? The beauty of our system is every two years or four years, or in some cases six years, we get a chance to yeah. reelect these people. Right, right. It's the one thing. I would say new politicians, for the most part, they're going there. They want to do the right thing. They start to get absorbed by the system in some cases. Um, they need the public to put pressure on them to make the right decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's what, uh, that's what we can do. We call it the political vice. Mm -hmm. 
What about term limits? You think something like that would help? You think term limit would help in this, in this, in this particular case? T term limiting. Well, Congress, you know, maybe maybe give it uh, give it three terms for the Congress side and the Senate side, maybe two or three. A lot of people talking about seniority, but from what I've seen on Fox and CNN, <laughs> you know, you could get elected tomorrow and do a better job. Yeah, you know, we have. You'd be interested. <laughs> I'm a community organizer. You know, I'm I'm qualified. So you know, we, um, you know, I, 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 there's term limits in some of our counties in yeah, Washington. Right. In others, there's not. Right. I don't see them making any better decisions necessarily right. than the ones exactly. that aren't. Right? right. So exactly. I'm not sure that term limits solves the problem. What solves the problem is getting people involved in their government from the local level, from mosquito boards all the way up to the legislature. Well, what, what are you feeling out there? And what are you hearing about good people and why they're not right? What are they saying? Well, there's there's a million excuses for not running. But what I am hearing is I'm seeing good people that are running mm -hmm. and winning. Well, you are. And they're starting to do good, good things. Good sign. Good sign. Yeah, one of those is David Mador in Clark County. Yeah. You look at what that guy's starting to do in Clark County. To promote the ideas of prosperity and opportunity in Clark County is fantastic. Okay, uh, you know there's a million excuses and a million people that aren't doing things. There's guys like Dave and Medora, and there's a lot of them out there. Um, we're trying to work to get these people connected and spread those ideas and get those things to start to take hold in Washington. I think you guys should do the same in, in yeah, Oregon. Yeah, well, Medora, very interesting guy, very positive guy, you know, very family oriented, the whole nine yards. I mean. The guy puts his money where his mouth is too. I mean, he just put, he puts his whole business on the line. Right? And had it not, you're right. Had it not been for in, individuals like him, mm -hmm. we'd be sitting up. Well, we'd be spending more than 220 million dollars. We're still spending money, but they're not they're not doing it on the Washington side. Okay? Yeah, in a lot of ways, he's one of the unsung heroes in in yes. Washington on this. So. Yes. Well, hey, right, this has been great, uh, and hopefully the viewing viewing audience really appreciated this. Uh, cause we need to hear a little bit about Washington and what they were doing in this, besides the other political side aspect of it. So we really want to thank you very much, Scott, for being with us, and, and hopefully you'll entertain the idea of coming back and seeing us again. Well, thanks, Bruce, and thanks for your military service, being a Marine. And so. Well, thanks for the back. Yeah, yeah, get back in the yeah, 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 yeah. I appreciate that. Well, hey, thank you very much, folks, and um, get back with us next week. We'll see you again. Okay, have a good one.